So we're going to continue our discussion of the environment within regulating environmental risk. And the first thing that we need to think about is the fact that um, the majority of benefits and costs from the federal government and its regulation stem from environmental rules. And we think that for about every dollar spent on regulation, the nation gets somewhere between 315 and 1907 in benefits. Um, now, of course, some of you are asking, well, how do we measure those benefits? Don't worry, we're going to get to that in some of the later videos. Um, but the problem is, you know, resources are not infinite. And so we need to make choices regarding which are the highest risks to human health and the natural environment. So what I'm going to talk about um, in this video and then also the next one is trying to understand how within a firm you can conduct a risk assessment looking at environmental risks and once you assess a risk, how do you actually manage it? So you decide which risks are the most important and then how do you manage them once you get there. So let's talk a little bit about risk assessment. So, the first thing that you need to look at is, um, regarding the risk assessment, is understanding that risk assessment is a pseudo-scientific process. You are trying to come up with a quote-unquote objective, quantifiable measure uh, posed by a substance. Um, and you may be thinking, well, you know, why is it pseudo-scientific? You have to remember, it's very, very hard to put a value on a human life. It's very hard to put a value on things like the environment because we don't have real ways of measuring it. So you're basically translating something that would be more qualitative, like quality of life or maintain the environment, and translating it into something that is financial or has a quantitative side to it. And you do that so you can translate, you, you translate from qualitative to quantitative because let's face it, most CEOs have an engineering or a finance background. They understand numbers, but maybe emotions less so. Okay? That's why you actually want to do the risk assessment. So it's a process of translation. Now, the EPA and other agencies make a lot of precautionary assumptions uh, based on this fear that scientific data may actually understate risk to human health. In other words, they err on the side of caution because, let's face it, we don't fully understand the human body, we don't fully understand pollution, and we don't fully understand how the two interact together. So they err on the side of caution, they err in, on the side of benefiting society, of course, at the cost of business. So therefore, risks are frequently overstated uh, to make sure that public health is protected with some sort of a margin of safety. So you begin your risk assessment with a hazard assessment. And a hazard assessment says, what or what or is there a link between this substance and a human disease? Now, once you think that there is some sort of a risk, then you can go ahead um, and try to prove how dangerous something is. And I forgot to write that on the board. I apologize. So if you think there is some sort of a risk, what do you do about it? Well, you can test in two ways. You can do animal tests. You can expose an animal to that toxin and see what happens. Of course, there's an ethical side of this. Why is it okay to test an animal when you can't necessarily run those tests on people? Again, that ties back into our speciesism argument. But furthermore, animals are not people. They are different. Mice, chimpanzees, rabbits, take your pick. They have different levels of tolerance than would a human subject. So it's not necessarily the most reliable either. And then we also have I was getting a little excited when I'm writing and talking. Epidemiological studies. And these are also problematic in my opinion. Hopefully you can see me. And epidemiological studies. are those, they, they measure real human illness, but they look at you know, macro level data of populations and certain geographies typically. So they can say, all right, we look at this 
um, power plant in this area and what is the rate of cancer of all the inhabitants living in that specific city and we can say that if more people get cancer in this area of a city because it's next that and there's also a power plant in the area we can conclude that there's some sort of relationship between living near a power plant and getting cancer that's what an epidemiological study will do so it measures real human illness now here's the problem there are so many other factors that you cannot control as a researcher that probably had nothing to do with the power plant. It could be that people in that town get cancer because they smoke and drink all the time. It could be that they have a lower life expectancy because they're getting in car accidents because there's not a stoplight in the town. And there's so many other reasons that people can get sick and die um, that may not have anything to do with the fact that you're testing. We can't really control human behavior in any sort of meaningful way. So that takes away a lot of the validity of an epidemiological uh, study. We've also got the dose response assessment. So once we say, okay, there's definitely a link between this substance and a disease, you've got the dose response assessment. Hopefully you can see me. And the dose response assessment says, okay, we understand that this substance is dangerous to people, but how much of that substance do you need before someone actually gets sick? Um, because let's face it, the human body is pretty robust. We can take in small amounts of toxins, small amounts of chemicals, the body can process it, and there may not be any sort of um, risk to human health. Okay? And the EPA uses what they call a linear dose response rate. So, for example, if you know that 100 grams of a toxin in a system gives you a 100% chance of cancer, then you would also know that a 1% uh, chance of cancer would be allocated to 1 gram of that particular substance. So the more direct, it's a direct correlation that they're trying to show. And they do that in favor um, of human safety. Now, a lot of people in industry would rather have some sort of a curve. So they'd say, well, actually, if you have 100 grams of a substance which will 100% give you cancer, then a one gram of that substance would probably have a 0% chance of cancer because your, bodily, your body can kind of regulate some of that stuff out. This is kind of a debate of which method is better, but the EPA uses the linear um, dose response rate um, in favor of human safety. We also have um, the exposure assessment. So we know it's dangerous. We can make some sort of an assessment of how much of that sub substance is dangerous to human health. And then we have to look at the exposure assessment. And the exposure uh, assessment says, okay, we know that it's dangerous, we know that there's, you know, this amount is dangerous, but just because it's dangerous, how much of that substance is going to get into a human body through inhalation, ingestion, or through skin absorption? I mean, there are some substances that are very dangerous, but they can be kept away in a safe place. It's not going to be uh, with people. And so therefore we don't need to worry about it. Or maybe you could put on rubber gloves and be protected, or maybe a face mask. Um, so in order to understand this, researchers have to measure the activities that bring individuals in contact with these toxic substances. And regulators present these estimates with a distribution of normal exposures. So once we say it's dangerous, here's the amount of response, or here's the amount that is dangerous, this is how likely people are going to actually be exposed to that in some sort of a dangerous way. Then we get into what we call risk characterization. And a risk characterization says some sort of an overall conclusion about the danger of a, subs of a substance. In other words, it's kind of a written narrative describing the evidence. Now, some of you may think that sounds familiar. Yeah, it's basically like writing a mini scenario. That's exactly what risk characterization is. And 
Risk characterizations are built on these calculations of toxicity, you know, potency, and exposure. And of course, precise characterizations of risk are limited. It's someone making a choice. Now what we're going to do is shift from risk assessment. So we're going to say now we, we understand this is dangerous. We accept that it's dangerous. Now what do we do about it? This is going to be our session on risk management. I'll see you then.